Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Wow, another great time of praise and worship. Amen. Hey, I, one of the things that, uh, that I want to mention to you very quickly again, it's our kindergarten, first and second graders, so it's children's church time. Miss Carrie is in the back, so please head on back there, kindergarten, first and second graders, and they'll be coming back here just a little bit, uh, but they're going to have a great time. Amen. Kindergarten, first and second graders, uh, you may head on out. It's a great reminder for, uh, with that song and what Patrick also said is I think sometimes even in the church, if we're not careful, we uh, kind of get this idea that God is way up out there and, and we have to lift up our voices to him and sing hard to reach him and for him to hear us or for him to interact with us. But that song is a great reminder that we don't have to reach up to him. He is here with us. Amen. Amen. And that he is, he is in us. And, and as we worship, we worship him as he is in this place. This is his place. Amen. So what a great reminder that is. And I pray that you will be able to uh, experience the fullness of God in all that we're doing uh, here this morning. I want to continue as we look at deacons uh, leading through serving. I want you to take your Bibles, if you will. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 6. Looking at verses 1 through 5, and we're going to be seeing today the idea of the position of deacon. We looked at last few weeks, we talked about the mindset of a servant and how uh, that all of us in the church should have this mindset of a servant, not to be served, and that's not our intention, but that we are the, the ones who serve. Last week we talked about help needed, and, and my friends, can I tell you that nothing has changed from last week to this week, we still need help, Amen. We need help at First Baptist West through the ministries of our church. There's not a single ministry that we have going on that doesn't require some help. So we need you uh, to be a part of that. Today, we're going to be looking at the actual position of a deacon. We're going to be looking at this, and, and not just what it says for a deacon, but as, as all of us in the church, that we ought to have these mentalities about us, that it's, it's about him, it's not about, about us. So why don't you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and we're going to stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning. <clears throat> now, in those days when the numbers of the disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in daily distribution. Then the twelves summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this, this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Perminus, and Nicholas, all the proselyte, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Father, we thank you for this day, and thank you for the many blessings you've given us, and God, we thank you for that great time of praise and worship, and, and God, that you have allowed us to be in your presence. Lord, we don't have to reach up to you. We don't have to reach out to you. God, you are here, and you are with those also, Lord, that are, are worshiping you with, in spirit and truth uh, through this live stream. And so, Father, I pray that you would just continue to draw us into your, to yourself. And, Father, I pray that the words that I'm about to say will not be mine but yours. I pray that this is a message you gave and not one that I made up. And that, Father, that the response would be from your people as you desire for it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Today I want to look at the position, the actual position of deacon, what it is that God has laid out for the church. Now, the one thing, that the, the first point is that, my friends, deacons are needed. Deacons are needed in the church because one of the things that was going on, we read here in this text, even starting at verse, uh, uh, verse 1, it says, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, in other words, the church was growing and people were coming to know Jesus. 
And what was going on is the church was there to meet the needs of, of the people to help, to minister to them. And it was becoming very difficult because you remember there were 12, uh, the, uh, 12 apostles. Now there's a difference between the apostles and the disciples. The apostles were the 12 who were called by, by Christ, who had witnessed him and, and had been called of him. Then the disciples were those who were followers of Jesus, those who came to know Jesus. And so what was going on, the church was growing, and these men who were the apostles were having a very difficult time in meeting all the needs of the people, helping everybody, ministering to them, but yet still able to spend time, uh, ample time, to study and to to, to preach the word of God like, like God had called them to do. And so what they were we were seeing was that there was going to be needing some help. I talked to you even last week about even in the church there's a need for help because what was going on is that we see is that the apostles were spread awful thin. There we go. The apostles were spread very thin. In other words, they just didn't have enough time to do this. And my friends, listen to me. They said that it's far be from us that we take the time and we go wait on tables. Can I tell you real quick here? This was not that they were feeling superior in any way, straight, say, shape, or size. They were not feeling superior. It wasn't that they didn't want to wait on the tables. It was the fact that if they did all of this, it would take away from them to be able to study and do the other things that God had called them to do. And so what was happening was they were trying to do all of that and also spend time trying to prepare and to reach people for Jesus. Now, I want you to understand, they, they, they were wanting to do this. They, were, they, they had the heart of servants, but the time was there, and they were spread awful thin. I want you to understand something. I, 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 I told them in the first service, I know sometimes that my messages may seem like it just I threw something together the last minute and, and tried to preach it, amen? But I, I promise you, I promise you, it takes some time to put one of these together. And man, just think about if, it was, if it's bad now, think about if I didn't pay, take time to study, amen? But they were talking about, man, it, it takes a lot of time to do this. So they were wanting to serve. They were wanting to do what they wanted to. And they, they were not above the crowd. They were not above the congregation. As a matter of fact, you, they, they kept thinking in their mind, it's not above us because even our Savior, Jesus, if you'll remember the night that he was crucified, what did he do? He washed all their feet. So they are not thinking we're too good for this. We are here to serve, and if that's what God has called us to do, we'll do it. Because no one, can I tell you, no one is above being a servant. I remember some years ago I, when I was pastoring at, uh, at Tipton uh, First Baptist Church, and we had had a fellowship after church, and uh, so, man, we had a big crowd there, and there were a lot of people eating, and, and just like what normally happens when, uh, when the food is served and everyone's eating, guess what most people do? They leave. Hey, guess what? There's still something left to do. You know what that is to do? Clean up. Remember that, okay? No. So just like typical church, everybody got their fill. They were finished eating, and they said, whoop, time to go home, take the nap, and off they go. Well, there was still a lot of stuff to be done. And so, of course, I, I grab a hold of a, a bucket and a washcloth, and, man, I, I go washing tables. And I'm wiping them down. This guy was a visitor from Arizona, he was a visiting a, a family of our in our church, and man, he walked up to me and he said, "Oh!" And he grabbed the washcloth from me and he said, "Oh, pastor, pastor, no, no, no." I said that's that's not a job for a pastor. You're not supposed to be doing this. He said, "Someone else needs to be doing this, not you." And I looked at him. And I said, "You know what? I've, I've always thought about it this way. If Jesus Himself could wash apostles' feet, I think I can wipe down some tables." You know what his response was? He said, you're right. And he gave me back the washcloth. I went, oh, man. I thought he was going to say, well, I will join in with you. Oh, no, he handed me the washcloth. And, and, he, and, and here's what he proved. Someone once told me, preacher, if you're willing to do it, the church will let you. Well, I was willing to do it, and that man let me, which was okay. But the fact of the matter is, none of us, I as the pastor, no one on my staff, no one in this room, no one watching this program, none of us are above serving. We're not too good to wipe some tables down. We're not too good to go out and help meet the needs of people and to do the things that they're supposed to do. And the problem was because the church was growing, people's needs were being neglected. 
Because there were these 12 trying to meet the needs of all the people and, and it wasn't happening the way everybody thought. And so what they wanted to do was they said, look, this isn't good. You're neglecting some people and it's very difficult. My, the ministry was not going as well as needed. People were needing the assistance of the, that the church could give them. Can, can I make a point here also very quickly? That I believe with all my heart the church can do a much better job at meeting the needs of people than the government can. Do you know why? Because the government was never, never, ever meant to do what it's doing. It's not meant to meet the needs of people. That was given to the church. And that's what they were doing. They were the ones meeting the needs of people. Christians were the ones who were meeting. But somewhere along the line, the church has decided that, hey, you know what? It's a lot easier if we'll just pay our taxes and let the government do it. But now you see things have gotten so big, you can't keep control of anything. You can't make it run well. But they were having needs being met that wasn't being met. And so the church stepped up and said, it's time for us to meet the needs. Because the church, again, is much better at serving than anyone else. Because why? That should be our hearts. Our heart, the church's heart, should be one about service. Because Jesus even said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. Church, listen to me. None of us are here to be served. We ought to be here to serve. Deacons are not here to be served. They're here to serve. So we looked and see that there was a need growing in the church there. The second thing is about the position, the actual position. And a couple of things that we see here by what they were asking of them to do, a couple of things that I want to bring up about the idea of deacon is, first of all, the deacon position is an active one, not an honorary one. It's not because we look around and say, oh, this person, is, is, oh, they're so good, they're so nice, and they've been in the church for 40 years. Let's honor them with the position of deacon. No, that's not what the deacon's position is. The deacon is that th these guys were to, called to roll up their sleeves and to wait on tables. They didn't say, hey, let's honor this guy and let's put him at the head of the table and let's everybody look at him and adore him while we serve him. That was not what they were called to do. They were called to, again, roll up their sleeves, get their hands dirty, get down in the middle of the ministry and to help take care of people. So it's an active one, not one that we just sit around and do nothing, but it's one that we're willing to sacrifice and to give. But not only that, but it's a, it's a servant position, not an authoritative position. Deacons are called to serve, not dictate. Deacons do not run anything or anyone. That's not what they're called to do. These guys were called to wait tables, not to tell what tables were to be waited on, not to have meetings to determine if somebody is actually waiting on the table right, but to wait on the tables. But somewhere along the line, especially in a lot of Southern Baptist churches, we've kind of lost that idea. And what the church has done is given the control and authority over to a group of men called deacons, and the, they just say, take care of the business, run the church. Nowhere in this did it say anything about them dictating or running any part of the church. They were there to serve. So there's no authority in the idea of a deacon. But also it's, it's humbling and not prideful. The, the position of deacon is a humbling position. It's not one that people go, I'm, oh man, I, I'm a deacon. I've been called to be a deacon. Look at me. I have, I have arrived. And now the church is going to be better. The preacher is going to do a much better job now because I'm going to see to it. There's nothing about the position that these guys were called to, if you look at them again, not one of them were called to be in a prestigious point. It takes someone special to become a servant. As a matter of fact, the idea of the job description, if, if, this were, if, if this ad were put in the newspaper for a position for a person to apply for, this is what it would read. Men who are willing to work long hours, be in some uncomfortable positions, and do what no one else will do while suffering some heartache and some pain without any pay. Now, I promise you, you put that in the newspaper, no one's applying for that job. Amen? 
So there's nothing prideful about this. You gain nothing from being the servant. Not in the physical sense. Not in the worldly sense. But you gain, you gain through Jesus Christ and willing to serve people. So my friends, it's a humbling position, not a prideful position. So we looked at the deacon needed. We looked at the position. Now I want to look at some spiritual qualifications. Now, if you'll take your Bibles and you'll look over into 1 Timothy chapter 3, what there is now is 1 Timothy takes from what the, the apostles were called to do, and, and basically there's some things in chapter 6 that get more specific over in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Because the first thing in chapter 6 that it says for them to do, he says, then find for you th th these men, seven men, first of all, of good reputation. Find seven men of good reputation. Now over in 1 Timothy, it talks about what does that mean? What are some very specific things as Paul is writing to Timothy and say, these are the specific details that you look for when you call this servant. The first one is call someone that is reverent. Reverent means respectful and acts with dignity, doesn't show themselves, doesn't go out and demand stuff and is a loud, ambitious uh, guy that just wants everybody to know what he thinks. That's not reverent. But you find a man who acts with dignity and purpose. Find someone that has this demeanor about them that's respectful and is respected. But the second one, he said, not just reverent, but find someone that is truthful. What that means is man, he's a man of his word. He doesn't try to trick people. He doesn't lie to them. He doesn't tell people what they want to hear. But he's respectful in it, but yet he's very truthful that his word means something. That if he tells you something, you know beyond a doubt this man is going to try to do it. He says, find someone that is truthful, but also find someone that's not given to much wine. Now, folks, listen, I'm not going to spend the rest of my time talking about the ills or benefits of alcohol. I'm not going to go there. That's not what this is meaning. What, did, what I do want to say, though, is, my friend, listen to me. Alcohol has destroyed many, 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 many lives. And he is telling us to avoid that, to avoid it. Not someone who, who goes out and, and desires all of this, this filling of the, of the spirits rather than the spirit. But also is not greedy. This means a man that I believe that it, it, according to the scripture that practices tithing as a spiritual discipline. He has set himself up. And whether you think it's a New Testament doctrine or not, the fact is I believe that God has given us a base idea of a goal to be spiritually mature to give a tenth that's a that's a discipline so he's looking for not so much as giving the money but the discipline of spiritual giving so i believe that this is what we're looking at here he's not greedy he's not about himself he's about being willing to give as god wants so that's the first one find a good man of good reputation we'll look back in chapter six again he says the second one is Full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. So then you look over, and we look back over 1 Timothy, and there's some things there that we're looking at. And the very first one is that, that they, we've got to be looking for is the full of the Holy Spirit is that he's a believer. Doesn't matter that he's good in business. Doesn't matter that he's good servant. Doesn't mean this. Doesn't mean that. He's, he's got to be a believer. Amen? Got to tell, share his testimony about the time that God saved him and forgave him of his sins. My friends, listen to me. That's one of the aspects that we go through when we select the deacons is, man, there's got to be a testimony there. We want somebody that's a believer, that knows Jesus. But also he says, the second part down there is, is, is in 1 Timothy, he says, but he's blameless. It means he's mature in his spiritual dealings and many he's been tried over time and, and, and there's not something there that, that is, is, is basically embarrassing or, or basically stuff that he's continually doing in his life that is there that will, people will be able to come back and hold against him. That he's blameless, he's honest, he's trying to serve God in the best way that he possibly can. And then the last one of full of the spirit, we look in 1 Timothy and it's holding to the faith. Holding the faith. Now, what does that mean? That means he holds true the scriptural doctrine. 
the disciples' doctrine. He's true to, to Scripture. Now, I have people all the time say, well, preacher, do you preach Southern Baptist doctrine? And you know what my answer is? No. I don't preach Southern Baptist doctrine. I preach New Testament doctrine. I preach the disciples' doctrine. And I'm going to continue to preach the disciples' doctrine. It just to me that it holds true to, to what we believe as Southern Baptists. If it didn't, listen to me, if the, if, if the disciples' doctrine did not hold true to what we believe as Southern Baptists, guess what? I wouldn't be a Southern Baptist. I would go to another church. I would find a church that desires the disciples' doctrine. Not, not Southern Baptist stuff. Now, I just believe Southern Baptists interpret the Scripture correctly. But when they begin, and some are beginning to not do that, guess what? I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of New Testament doctrine. So deacons must go with New Testament doctrine, holding the faith, full of the Holy Spirit. And the last one, very quickly, the last one that we look at is family. It's not moving there. There we go. Family. Because the thing that I want you to understand, my friend, is family matters. Amen? A family matters. He goes in First Timothy and he talks about uh, being the husband of one wife. That family matters. But it, it, and I've heard people say before, well, it doesn't really matter about the family, it matters about the man. That's not true. Because if you look in 1 Timothy, it even, even talks about the family. It gets specific and says, and likewise, the deacon's wife. So what, I, believe me, being a pastor of all the years that I've been a pastor, I'm telling you, if my wife isn't on board and my wife isn't supporting and living the life that I, I, I have to be living as a pastor, my ministry doesn't work. So family matters. Now, I, I, I've been a pastor now for most of my daughter's lives. There was a time I wasn't. I was a coach and I was a youth director, but I've been a pastor the biggest part of my life. I know about PKs. To y'all that don't, aren't in the lingo, it's preacher's kids. Amen? Preacher's kids. Preacher's kids get... <laughs> look, I got to over here going... Ah, ah. Preacher's kids, man. Preacher's kids can... Give dad pleasure, or they can give the guy a headache, amen? One thing that I found out about preacher's kids, and don't forget, you can't get on the preacher's kids without talking about those deacon's kids, amen? You better talk about them too. Now, the thing I found out, though, listen to me, is that my kids, my daughters, oh, they were, they're amazing women. But they have minds of their own. Who don't I know that? So it's not talking about that, that my family's got to be perfect. Because we're far, far from perfect. But it says that he guides, rules his family well. Doesn't mean rule over them and demand, and I'm the king and you're the servants. But it means he leads them with a pure heart. And listen, and in that family responds to his leading folks listen to me family matters when it comes to ministry it can it can build it up or it can destroy so you find these things and it it basically the the outline here is again therefore brethren seek among you seven men of good reputation full of the holy spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business what business? Serving. So in the next few weeks, we're going to begin that process of finding men who will serve as our deacons. It's time that we begin to do this. And, and if you're a member of First Baptist West, here in the next week or so, you're going to be getting letters and, and letters that, that explain the process of what we're going to be doing. It talks about these things that I've even preached about here today. And it gives you an opportunity to select men that you have prayed about, that you sense already do this by what you've seen and what you've experienced. 
And then you're going to get to be a part of helping us select these men for this business that we've just talked about. And it's a time for us to be praying. It's a time for us to be seeking God's will. God, who do you want us to choose? Because this is going to be important to be able to perform the duties that this church, and my friend, listen to me, I want a church that is serving people. I want a church that's serving the community. I want a church that's making a difference. I want to be a part of that church. I want to pastor that church. But we're not going to be able to do it without people surrendering their lives to Jesus, that we have people that are surrendering their lives to serving Him, that we have men who are honorable men who want to do nothing but please God and and, and help further the ministries of First Baptist West. That's what we're looking at. That's over the next couple of weeks. So we're going to be asking you to pray about it. I don't want to start right here, right now. I want to ask our praise team to come back up. And during this time, I want you to be praying. And this be our starting point. But my friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you this morning, come to know Him today. If you're at home and you're you're there, man, you can call upon the name of the Lord and you can be saved. You, You can begin a walk with Him that I promise you will literally change your life. Would you do that today? Or maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but that joy, man, I'm missing that joy. I'm missing that that sacrifice. I'm missing that servant, that servant's heart. And I want I want to surrender myself back to him today. And I, I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to be where he wants me to be. I want to do what he wants me to be doing. And I surrender that today. Would you do that this morning? And we're getting ready to to pray, and then we're going to stand and we're going to sing. I want you at home to join us as well as we sing and we commit ourselves to what God desires for us to be. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for your love and for your grace. And God, as we are here today, I pray that you would begin to burden our hearts about serving. That God, you would also burden our hearts about men that you want us to, to, to nominate as deacons. To, to serve in this church, to serve our people. Lord, not to be honored by it, not to just sit around and, and lay claim to the title, but Lord, men who are willing to roll up their sleeves, be committed to the purpose, to the business, as it says here in Scripture, to the business of serving. And Father, I pray for others in our church. I pray for those at home, that God, if they're here this morning, and, and Lord, they just feel a sense of need to be serving you, that Father, you would lead them and you would guide them And that, Father, that you would lead them into the ways to go. And that, Father, we as a church could be able to use that to further our ministries. Let today be that day. In Jesus' name.